In 2007, Adam Sandler and Don Cheadle played through Shadow of the Colossus over the course of the movie Rain Over Me. It was the first instance in recent memory that I remember the video game community actually liking a film's depiction of video games. It felt like the first time they were played straight, for a real narrative purpose in a somber drama for adults and not as incidental visual material for a teen comedy. It made other depictions of video games look like other Adam Sandler movies. That same year, a federal judge blocked California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger's attempt at restricting the sale of violent video games to minors on the grounds that it violated the First Amendment rights of minors, suggesting that violent video games should be given the same legal protection that Schwarzenegger's own violent movies enjoy. In 2008, the Library of Congress began forming committees to archive video games for historical preservation. Three years later, the defense of games as art was turned into federal law, with the Supreme Court deciding in 2011 that the California ban was unconstitutional and that the interactive nature of video games did not exclude them from becoming just as important to human history as any other mediums. In that same year, the influence of Shadow of the Colossus became more and more visible. Games like Dark Souls, Journey, and Breath of the Wild released with the quiet reverence for Shadow's lonely landscapes and environmental storytelling, while indie projects like Titan Souls and Pray for the Gods marketed their inspiration more loudly in 2018, the same year Shadow of the Colossus was remade faithfully shot by shot, with all the original experience intact sans the golden hazy color scheme and the magic of seeing the original game look as good as it did on a console as underpowered as the PS2. But more important than vast landscapes and environmental storytelling is what I saw happen to game writing between Shadow's original release and its remake. Games became self-reflective. Shadow of the Colossus paved the way for Far Cry 3, the Tomb Raider reboots, and Spec Ops The Line. Ah, oh, jeez. Where's all this violence coming from, man? The video games? I bet it's the video games. Games started indulging in framing video game violence, after all its decades of controversy, as a moral dilemma. Why do you continue to follow your orders while your superiors betray you? Why did you come here? <clears throat> well, I'll tell you then. You enjoy all the killing. That's why. What? Are you denying it? Haven't you already killed most of my comrades? That was... <laughs> While that certainly happened before, with late-game twists and metaphorical interpretations admonishing the player for their selfish actions, Shadow of the Colossus is generally regarded as doing it better, for bringing that dilemma into the first few minutes of the experience, and for doing it with a well-funded first-party publisher that had the world's most popular console manufacturer being the unlikely harbinger for one of gaming's more quiet, artsy experiences. In Shadow of the Colossus, it's apparent from the get-go that you're not exactly playing as the good guy. Wander, our protagonist, makes a covenant with the ominous deity Dorman to destroy 16 massive colossi to return his dead loved one back to life, setting us up for a game that exclusively has you defeating enemies that simply act like animals defending their territory. In each case, you are the aggressor. You enter their homes, you provoke them into a fight, and you stand confusingly triumphant over a heroic accomplishment that carries with it a sense of guilt. Guilt composed by a soundscape mixing melancholy and romantic tones, with little non-diegetic noise and dialogue breaking the harmony of scenes driven almost entirely by orchestra.
The visage of an unspoiled wilderness populated by giants, social rules predicated on human sacrifice, ruins resembling ancient archaeological sites, and direct vocal contact with a formless god all paint the picture of an ancient original sin myth come to life. In the creation myths of Japanese Shinto, the forces of nature exist before the supernatural. In the beginning, the universe was an unknowable, chaotic nothingness. Eventually, primordial elements mixed and stirred to create the heavens, an ocean earth, and the first few generations of kami, deities, spirits, and abstract forces of varying morality and power, who would go on to create the islands of Japan and its mountains, as well as the sun, the moon, the animals, and humans, as well as millions upon millions of other kami, who exist as unseen entities that inhabit the same mundane realm as ours. Kami are neither good nor evil by default, but they become that way depending on human behavior. Environmental pollution and social decay are written into these creation myths, creating tragedies that formed the historical identity of Japan. Their reverency for social harmony and honor, their reverence for their ancestors, their reverency for nature, and their reluctance to pollute. The kami are not always a benevolent force. If mankind behaves badly, these entities strike back. In the ending of Shadow of the Colossus, Wander's efforts undo a social order that has been keeping a kind of peace in these forbidden lands for eons. The godlike Dormid fulfills his promise, but with the catch, and the true nature of the Colossi are revealed as protective seals designed to keep this deceitful deity away from mankind, up until it's us that lets him loose. These cultural morals are retold in multitudes of classic Japanese games, from The Legend of Zelda to Final Fantasy to, of course, O oh Kami. And just as Zelda and Miyazaki films succeeded so well at doing before, Shadow of the Colossus managed to appeal to a worldwide audience, steadily selling a respectable 3 million copies by 2005 standards, bolstered by an inclusion into the PS2's Greatest Hits label, where it would go on to a discounted $20 price that saw sales volume increase further. A heavy marketing campaign helped, but I don't doubt that Shadow's simple design and accessible playability also propelled it into the mainstream. The game's pacing is consistent and satisfying, regularly delivered in a loop of three activities. Exploration, as you navigate the landscapes towards the Colossus, puzzles, as you figure out how to climb onto the Colossus, and then a bit of conventional action gaming once you're on, juggling the more traditional video game archetypes of meter management, obstacle courses, and trick jumps to finally reach their glowing weak points for massive damage. It rode the line between something classic and something new, and its appearance in Hollywood movies was no mistake. Mass audiences knew about this game, and the respectful way in which it tackles problems video games traditionally stumbled over. To say it accomplishes that with narrative efficiency is maybe less true than to say it does it with interactive grace, raising another bar that I saw games throughout the 2010s attempt to reach. Thematically evocative gameplay mechanics. Like a character that stumbles, tumbles, and bumbles his way through uncontrollable tripping animations, the fragile, imperfect nature of your puny human navigating a mythological world of gods and titans is evoked by how much of your own control is simply lost by him losing his balance. Your character trips and stumbles, he even blacks out for entire seconds at a time after taking some hits. The controllability of your camera sends a similar message. It automatically pans upwards towards the landscape, zooming away from your character until you are dwarfed by massive geology. It follows soft rails of predetermined pathways and a cinematic rule of thirds the whole way through. Camera angles used while on the Colossus cover your view with visual obstacles and heavy motion blur. The feeling of your hands grasping onto these shoulder buttons as you're helplessly tossed around creates moments that evoke the sensation of simply closing your eyes and having to hold on for dear life, like a ship being tossed about in a storm. The defiancy of your horse evokes a real horse with a mind of its own. 
a horse who sometimes just plain doesn't want to do what you want it to. On the flip side, this horse won't run off cliffs or walk cycle into walls and has a kind of pathfinding AI of its own. It's quite possible to just point yourself in the direction you want to go, set the controller down, and the horse will find its way there all on its own. But despite controlling characters and a camera that often decide to have a mind of their own, it's not exactly a complicated game to pick up and play. As obtuse as some puzzle solutions are, clearly marked fur provides a clear visual pathway on top of most of the Colossus. How the hell do you climb on top of a bird mid-flight? Grab onto the furry part, just like with the other monsters. This is one of the rare examples of a game where you can safely run towards the camera. Thanks to the sheer abyss of emptiness of most of these arenas, as well as some clever texture work warning you of incoming danger that, that I don't think I've seen outside of Mario. The game especially teases you with this deception of control during two moments towards the end. One in which, despite the way this bridge looks, you have to sacrifice your horse to make it over. This foreshadows a grand finale that can have you bunny hopping your way out of Dorman's punishment for entire minutes at a time. But ultimately, neither you nor your character can escape this kind of divine intervention. And the sum of all its parts created one of the first games that mainstream audiences were ready to accept as some kind of a brilliant work of art. The game's inclusion in a somber Adam Sandler movie wasn't just product placement, nor was it there just because it looked good on a screen and appealed to an adult audience. It was because it reflected something deeper and more personal inside of these characters, something that the filmmakers intentionally wanted the game to bring out of them. Kotaku's Brian Ashcraft interviewed the editor who introduced the director to the game, Jeremy Rausch, who's responsible for its inclusion in the film. The character of Charlie is a New Yorker who lost his family during 9-11, and to put it in Rausch's words, you could see where someone who is dealing with 9-11 would be engrossed by a giant that keeps collapsing over and over again. Charlie's therapy was Shadow of the Colossus. Art is any piece of work that's intended to make you feel the kind of human emotions that are unique to the human experience. Art precedes technology. Art is the blueprint for progress. Art is the manifestation of ideas. It's what bridges the gap between the human imagination and mundane reality. Art is the expression of individuals becoming something more important than the individual, part of a greater purpose or of a higher power. Art is broad, art is abstract, and art will ultimately become formless. Art is work that makes life more meaningful than the struggle for survival and procreation. That is art. <laughs>